Oh, oh, they've made a terrible decision. Oh, look, the fact the police are up. Yeah. What is wrong with people? Indeed. My name's Gary and welcome back to the Channel England Football and today I'm going to be asking the question, does English football still have a serious problem with violence? Those pictures you've just seen in the beginning of this video were the videos and clips from the European final that England and Italy competed and that is English fans breaking in and attacking their own fans, but breaking into Wembley Stadium. So I'm going to take a quick look at where English football violence is now, or I think it is now, based on where it's come from. And I'm going to give my verdict, and if I feel it is still a big problem in this country. So without further delay, let's get into it. <laughs> So first of all, if you're new to the channel, please like and subscribe. And at the end of this video, please leave a comment down below on your thoughts. Most people, well, nobody can argue that during the 70s and 80s, English football was known as the slob, the antagonist, the, the yob of European football. So much so, actually, that during the late 80s, English teams were actually banned for competing in European tournaments. I know, or from what I'm seeing on a lot of my comments, is that that reputation, that I wouldn't say well earned, but certainly earned during the 70s and 80s, is still a reputation that many European fans hold against England today. They still feel like this English fan base, our, our national following, is still a violent bunch of yobs, or certainly a, a good section of them still believe that. I'll be giving my thoughts. I'm going to break that down on where English football has come from the 70s and 80s, all the way through to the present day and where I think it is up until this point, including what impact that uh, those events at Wembley had. So obviously, as discussed, during the uh, late 70s and early 80s, moving through actually to the late 80s, England had a huge, huge problem of football violence. There was a whole host of disasters, including things like England fans storming, uh, storming Turin in 1980. Uh, there was hundreds of fans arrested in Germany in 1988. Um, there was loads of, obviously, the Hillsborough disaster does come into that during the late 80s, 1989. Uh, but the big turning point, um, the, the, these were quite common occurrences, but the big turning point was the Hayesaw disaster in 1985, where, as we all know, sadly, 39, I believe it was 39, Juventus fans died from a wall collapsing and that was following English fans charging at them within the ground. English clubs were rightly, I think, banned from competing in all European tournaments till 1990. Now, in order to combat this, and no English fans will sit here and argue that there wasn't a problem within English football. There was a huge problem in English football. So much so that a lot of people didn't go to the games. A lot of people certainly wouldn't take the children to games during the late 80s. Um, but the British government, particularly, like I said, after the 1985 incident with Juventus, British government started to react and make some changes. So some of the things that started to come in were things like the 1986 Public Order Act, which permitted courts to ban supporters from grounds. That was a huge turning point in English football because essentially there was nothing stopping previous offenders re-attending matches. But this 1986 Public Order Act permitted courts to do so. That was then followed by the Football Spectators Act in 1989. It banned convicted hooligans from international matches. Uh, the Football Disorder Act then was later in 1999. Um, and then it changed from domestic to international. It applied to internationals as well. There's then been numerous other legislations over the years, particularly 
uh, targeting around stopping religious intolerance and missile throwing and things like that that have still continued to be an issue. The football banning orders were a huge turning point, actually. That was introduced during the Football Spectators Act in 1989. So basically, what that meant is certain fans could be literally stopped from attending games. Known fans would be targeted uh, leading up to matches to make sure they didn't have any involvement. And that is still something. Football banning orders are still used today within the UK, um, and particularly within English football. And I'll come on to those in a minute because we've got some statistics to show moving forward. Football violence now isn't anywhere near the levels it was in the late 70s and late 80s. And, you know, it just isn't. Football grounds are considerably safer places to, to attend now. However... You know, there has been some high-profile incidents more recently. So let's take, for example, the incident where Jack Grealish was punched by a fan running onto the pitch. You had Liverpool fans smashing up buses of opposing teams as they arrived at the ground. You then obviously had the Rangers incident in, um, obviously this is Scottish football, but, you know, it's based on the UK in Manchester when they didn't win the Europa League final. You had Liverpool fans again completely trashing... um, Liverpool Dockyards area following their Premier League victory Um, and all these come under the public disorder you know violence you know antisocial behaviour these are quite recent things and most recently obviously is incident at Wembley that occurred only a few weeks ago it was let's be honest from an England point of view it completely overshadowed the final particularly them because we didn't win it Um, but it was absolutely embarrassment I cannot think of any other major final where any other Hosting teams, fans have literally trashed the entire city before the game and tried to storm the the actual stadium. It was an absolute disgrace of a uh, display. And it's one of the reasons now why I wanted to make this video. So I started to do some digging. So having a look currently at the way uh, England football is at the moment. So the Home Office now releases football-related arrests and banning order statistics for England and Wales. And I've got the latest set of figures here in front of me, which I'll be displaying on the screen. These represent figures from the 2019 to 2020 season. Season. Obviously, there's not going to be really anything, and even if there is anything from the 2020 to 2021 season, it's going to be pretty irrelevant due to COVID. We're going to take a look at um, some of these statistics from, from the latest Home Office. So let's first move on to football banning orders. So I've already spoken about them. So in recent years, as of the 1st of August 2020, as you'll see, there have been 1,621 football banning orders were in force. And that represents actually a decrease of 8% when compared with those basically in August 2019. These have been steadily in decline, it states, banning orders in force since 2011, when there actually was 3,174 in force. So currently there's 1,621, but in 2011 there were 3,174. So minus 8% football banning orders in, in the year. So that obviously represents a good thing, you know. Football banning orders are down. However, so just looking again more closely at those figures from the football banning orders, um, you've seen there that from 2010 to 2011, um, banning orders issued in a season is dramatically down. That's the lighter colour. And then banning orders issued prior to the season is actually dramatically down from the 2010-2011 season. And the overall, obviously, then that means that they are down. Um, So that, that in itself does represent that something is going off. However, that doesn't mean obviously violence has stopped. It just means that football well, banning orders aren't being used as much. So to look into more further detail, I'm going to uh, let's take a look at some arrests. So in the 2019-2020 season, there were 1,089 football-related arrests. Uh, arrests, sorry, under Schedule One of the Football T- Spectators Act 1989. So that's the act I've previously mentioned, and that is a 21 decrease on the previous season. So that obviously is a huge decrease in recent years. Granted, though, and it does need to be taken into consideration that these statistics do actually involve. A lot, uh, the, the last few games of the season which were played behind the closed doors but the majority of this season was open to the general public of these 1089 incidents uh, most of them were public disorder and violent disorder so public disorder made up 34 percent and violent disorder made up 26 percent clubs with the highest number of supporters arrested and this is no no dig on these clubs at all but this is just what the home office have recorded so Leeds United were the most with 52 arrests Birmingham City were the second most with 49 arrests and Bolton Wanderers were the third most with 45 arrests and so most of them in the north of England in addition there were 114 arrests by British Transport Police and 204 other um, non-schedule one arrests at football matches in the 2020 19 to 20 season. So 
the reason why uh, I want to include that last part is because 114 arrests, you know, if you that is arrests outside of the ground, so that's people travelling to and from the stadium, and obviously some of those arrests that they say aren't related to the Football Spectators Act, but not uh, but necessarily did occur during football games, so or in and around stadiums during that time. So it's not a huge number, is it? You know, just on the face of it, considering how many people actually attend games within this country week in week out, it isn't on the face of it a huge huge. A huge, huge amount. Moving on from that last part then. So those those are the type of arrests that are being made. So this is going to put it into context really about what that figure actually means in the wider context of people attending England matches or at least people living in and around England and Wales and how that relates to per population. So football related arrests per 100,000 attendees. Sorry, so this is the amount of people who attend matches by competition for the 2019-20 season. So by far... Well, not by far, but the highest uh, league with that. So 4.9 people per 100,000 in League One um, were arrested at football matches. That isn't, let's be honest, a huge figure. The, if we're looking where the Premier League is, the Premier League is actually the lowest at 2.9. But the overall for England and Wales is 3.3. So 3.3 people per 100,000 that attend a match, I don't think is a huge figure. Now... There is, again, there's other things behind that because a lot of people report that a lot of violence may now take place outside of grounds, uh, certainly in designated fields or places where the police aren't around or anything like that. However, this is based on what is likely to happen if you turn up at a football game within this country. Now, those figures to me reflect that England isn't a violent place to go and watch football. It really isn't. There's no, you know, there's hardly any arrests. I mean, 3.3 per 100,000. You know, you're suggesting then that if you go to, you know, three or maybe four, four grounds with 30,000 ca uh, 30, capacity, if you go to four matches with 30,000 capacity, you anticipate that three rests will be made over those four games. It's not a huge amount. It's not great, but it's not, it's certainly not a dangerous or violent um atmosphere just breaking down those then football related arrests by british transport police they still decrease by 26 percent. so this is still away from the ground so in the in the 1920 season there was additional 114 related arrests by btp that's british transport police in connection with reg regulated international and domestic football matches involving english and welsh and national teams this represents a 26 percent minus 41 decrease from 155 in the previous season the most common type of offensive game was the public disorder for more information it says go to british transport police so you can have a look at this information yourself just going on then to overall incidents because obviously sometimes arrests don't always correlate to actually what incidents are made they may obviously not be arresting certain people because it may be difficult to do in certain certain circumstances but looking at this information here in the 2019-20 season there were 2,663 related uh, regulated sorry domestic football matches involving english and welsh teams Incidents were reported at 969 fixtures. So out of 2,663 uh, games, 969 had a reported incident. But that could be any incident. That could literally be from swearing to public disorder to letting off a flare or anything like that. That represents 36% of total matches. Whilst the number of reported incidents has decreased by 4%, from the 1,007 report in the previous season, the proportion of fixtures where an incident was reported was similar to 33%. So at 36% or 33%, it, it sounds like, you know, almost a third. It sounds like a lot, doesn't it? It does sound like a lot. But like I said, these numbers do need to be broken down. That doesn't necessarily mean that's 50 fans storming a stadium or, you know, it's riots or anything like that. It may literally be someone setting off a flare. It may be someone consuming alcohol in the wrong area. It could be a whole range of things. So on the face of it, and for the amount of people that actually attend those 2,663 games, it's not a huge figure. So there will still be clearly those people though that argue that violence within English football is a huge, huge problem. And I would say that I don't agree with that. I don't agree that football in this country is a huge problem, as you may state. However, it clearly is a problem. But it, I would say, I would say, in fact, I would say violence in English football isn't a problem. I think violence in British society maybe. Now, 
I haven't got statistics for this, but I can pretty much be certain that if we started to look at violence across any major, huge major thing, particularly with football being such a big sport it is in this country, and I think I said in this video, a lot of those fans that storm that ground aren't regular fans, they wouldn't go. It brought out the worst in our society, there's no doubt about that, and it clearly shows the ugly side that still exists within English football and within English society on the right occasion. However, it's been a long, long time a long, long time since I've seen English fans en masse be involved in any sort of disruption. Uh, from an international point of view, that is. There have been, as I've said, club football incidents. But again, if you're looking at the number of matches they're involved with, it's still pretty much few and far between. I don't think English, English football now has a worse problem than any other country in Europe. I think we're pretty much on par. Um, I think you've got many millions of fans now within this country that... Football now is a place where you can take your family and, you know, your wife, your kids, and or, or your kids, sorry, I'm not being sexist, your husband and your kids then, if you like. It is a safe place to take the family to go and watch a game. Yes, you'll still hear probably some bad language, but other than that, violence, I have never, I have never witnessed violence firsthand at an English football stadium. Um, so I don't believe it is a huge problem. It's not something that when you go to football matches you're conscious of. It is quite shocking and it does make front page headlines now because it is rare. You know, it is a rare thing. Having said that as well, I do also believe that when English fans are involved in any sort of violence, it is exaggerated, particularly from an international point of view. It is incredibly highlighted. And I think that goes back to a reputation we earned, which we shouldn't have done, uh, through the disgraceful behaviour of England, uh, travelling fans abroad and at home during the 70s and 80s when we were the gutter from a fan's point of view of, a, uh, of European football. We really were. However, I do feel like English football has come a long way and I will, I will recommend anybody to come to England and watch a game with their family, you know, with their kids and I guarantee you, you will more likely than not have a very, very safe and enjoyable experience. And that is something I believe is fact, uh, based on these statistics that I've just gone through from the Home Office and based on just the general, my first-hand experience at football games. The Wembley incident does represent um, a, a rare, unique in quite unusual circumstance nowadays. We're hearing reports, in fact, someone's, I think, has been charged today, a member of the Wembley staff been charged of stealing cards so other fans could access. I think it was such a huge event, that final. It brought out the gutter in society. Uh, the fact that tickets were limited due to COVID didn't help as well. And obviously the fact that the event just didn't seem prepared for hundreds of thousands of fans to turn up without a ticket. However... The fact that Wembley Way, if you look at pictures of Wembley Way that day, it is absolutely packed. And if you look at the pictures of people storming, it looks like a lot, but count them. Count them per head. If you know, go back to the start of this video and count them, you are looking at no more than 50 to 100 people involved in there. I guarantee you now there was at least 100,000, up to 200,000 people there on that day. So I don't believe English football has a incredibly difficult or challenging problem with football violence like it did in the 80s. Obviously, it still has a problem because it still exists, but I don't think our problem is any considerably different to those of any other European nation. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please like and subscribe and comment. Please let me know what other videos you want me to cover. You know, I can. Uh, I think I'm going to probably look at maybe the racism side as well, so I've done the violence side and maybe looking at the racism. I'm also going to then start to look at some statistics around, you know, who may be you know an England player to look out for coming into the next season and then we'll have a look at some other videos as well moving forward I want to start changing the format around this is taking me a little bit longer to make but thank you very much for joining me on this episode